with TAN Books. Thanks for joining us today at the TAN Roundtable. French Catholic philosopher Leon Bloy once said that the only great tragedy in life is to not become a saint. Many Catholics focus on the externals, what we're doing, what we've done, but we often lose sight of just one thing, the interior life. So in today's roundtable, we will discuss the stumbling blocks to a holy interior life and how to overcome them. In addition, we'll discuss some practical things that every Catholic can start doing today to advance in their prayer lives. One thing is certain, to become a saint, you must build up your interior life. Joining us today for our discussion are our guests, Father Luke Mary Fletcher, Father David Miller, and Father Robert Nixon. This is the TAN Roundtable, and you can find a new live conversation here every month. We're giving you personal access to our authors and our favorite guests on topics concerning the church and the world today. So back to our speakers. Father Luke Mary Fletcher is a priest for the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. He was ordained in May 2003 and since then has become a well-known speaker at both the national and local faith conferences, giving even staff retreats to the fine folks over at EWTN. He's also the Shrine Chaplain for the National Blue Army Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. Father Fletcher, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Father David Miller grew up in North Carolina. He's one of 12 siblings. He graduated from the Franciscan U University at Steubenville. For three years, he discerned with a congregation of Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception of the Most mm -hmm. Blessed Virgin Mary. And he was later ordained a priest for the Diocese of Charlotte in 2010. He's currently the pastor of St. Dorothy's in Lincolnton. A warm welcome to you, Father Miller. Thank you very much for having me. Last but not least, but Benedictine Father Robert Nixon gave up a career in classical music in 2013 to become a monk in Western Australia and now lives in Australia's only monastic town, New Norcia. Father Robert is joining us from the TAN headquarters in North Carolina this week as he makes a trip stateside. He's a fellow of Trinity College of Music in London, as well as the London College of Music. Father Nixon has translated all six of the TAN resurrection titles we'll be highlighting today, some of which are being made available for the first time in English due to his wonderful work. Father Nixon, it's great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Mary. It's great to be here. So just a little housekeeping, we will be giving away a bundle of these wonderful books from our TAN Resurrection line that I just mentioned, translated by Father Robert here with us today. At the end of our webinar, we'll be announcing our winner. So stay tuned to see if it's you. These are such amazing books as The Crown of the Virgin, one of my personal favorites, The Passion of Christ Through the Eyes of Mary by St. Anselm of Canterbury, The Glories of Heaven, again by St. Anselm, and Meditation on the Holy Angels by St. Aloysius Gonzaga. I went to Gonzaga University. I think it's amazing. I'm holding a book in my hands translated by Father Robert from, from St. Aloysius Gonzaga. That's amazing. Anyway, so stay tuned to the end to make sure to see if you are the winner. At the end of our conversation, we'll also give you a 40% off discount code for any of the books we're going to mention today. So stay tuned for that as well. Before we launch into our discussion about sainthood and the interior life, we'd always like to kick it off with asking our guests what tan book you're reading now or your favorite tan book if you have one and just what else you're in the middle of. We'd like to hear what everyone's reading. So Father Luke, let's go ahead and begin with you. All right. Well, um... I don't have a copy to show you, but I am reading through a, a new book you're about to put out that Father translated, the Meditation on the Seven Last Words of Christ According to St. Bonaventure. Oh. So, um, but my, my all-time favorite tan book, although I've been an avid tan book reader for years, but to be honest, my, my absolute favorite one is this one right here. Oh. And it's written by Sister Genevieve of the Holy Face, also known as Celine Martin. She's the sister of St. Therese Little Flower. And this book is so amazing and good. Um, for years, I've read and studied the writings of St. Therese Little Flower. And boy, I, th I thought, okay, I understand and I know. And, and then I came across this book. And uh, boy, I realized that there was so much more I just didn't know. So this sister, uh, Celine, had been... Uh, in, the, in the, her own words, the first person to be trained in the school of the little way. Therese was her novice mistress. 
and as Trez died very young, Celine, our sister Genevieve the Holy Face, lived to be quite elderly. And all those years, she was the one that the popes and the cardinals and different theologians would talk to her to get clarification on certain points of St. Therese's doctrine. And uh, she distills all of that in this book. And I, I almost feel like I, I know Tan also publishes the story of the soul, which is the autobiography of St. Therese, a primary source. And I'd love to see this book published with it, like together, because what she says here complements and clarifies so well and an uh, absolute favorite. My gosh, that's beautiful. What a beautiful idea. I hope our editors are watching. It's a wonderful idea. We'll see if it comes to fruit. <laughs> Father Robert, you? Well, uh, one of my great favorite Ted books, which I've read, only just finished recent, read recently, is the uh, St. Garland Mafia. Mm. And uh, this book is very illuminating and sheds a lot of light upon the complexities of the times in which we currently live. But I have to say my favorite uh, Tan book and my favorite book uh, in general, apart from sacred scripture, is The Imitation of Christ mm. by Thomas Akempis. And he's a wonderful author. I've been uh, talking about Thomas Akempis with uh, Connor Gallagher today. And, um, and you know, he's uh, continually a source of inspiration and his great words are a source of such fortitude and wisdom. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Father Miller? Uh, Obviously, it's hard to choose one, but uh, I think the one that's stood out to me uh, ever since college was the trustful surrender to the divine providence. Um, Tan prints out this wonderful little copy. You've got it behind you there. And uh, I would say this is kind of my compendium, second only to the Bible. And uh, it was very transformative in my own spiritual development. And I yeah, recommend it to everyone. I'm currently reading, I don't know if it's Tan, though, so you'll have to forgive me, but Ensinu Yezu. So okay. this is the first time reading this for me. It's uh, Anyone can read it, but it's, it's especially for priests, and I've just been slowly working through it for some time. It's uh, There's so much to, to consume. You know, I don't want to rush it. That's wonderful. That's a beautiful collection. I don't know if I've had a set of guests with such a robust... A dense collection of books for spiritual reading. That could be the webinar right there, everyone. Read all of those books and you're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll be good. Wonderful. So to start us off on our topic on the interior life, I'd like to begin hearing just a bit from each one of you about your own path to your current vocations. You're all ordained priests, but you're all for different orders. We have a Franciscan friar, we have a Benedictine monk, monk, we have a diocesan priest. It sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it's not. You're all here. Um, I'd love to hear how your own prayer and discernment brought to you to where you are now. So, Father Robert, would you begin with that? Yeah, so um, I was raised in a very devout Catholic family and attended Catholic schools and was involved in the church from a young age uh, as, a, as a church organist from the age of about 11 and as an altar server uh, in reading ministry and so forth. And I felt... Um, that I was called to the service of the church, that one day I would be the priest celebrating the mass. And this uh, spoke to me deep in my heart. And I had a really very strong devotion to the Blessed Virgin. I felt always that she would be my guide in my uh, in my future life, and which has indeed proven to be the case. But I had another great passion in my life, which was music. And um, I loved music and playing music. And it was just something which I, I felt I needed to do to get out of my system for for at least a few years. So I, when I finished school, my first step wasn't to enter a seminary, but to study music and to follow a career as a professional musician for a number of years. I did that and I was involved also in, in school and university teaching. Um, then I reached uh, my 33rd year of age and I reflected at this stage, this is as long as Christ lived in his whole mortal life. I thought he saved the world during that time. Thought during this time, I've basically just lived to entertain myself. So I, I, I resolved from then on to give the rest of my life to the service of the church. But my first step wasn't to become a Benedictine monk. I didn't actually know any monks. I'd never actually visited a monastery. All I knew of monasteries and monks was what I'd seen in movies and read in books. So it seemed like something very medieval, but, you know, kind of exotic and remote. But I did know a lot of diocesan priests. 
and I knew how great the need for diocesan priests was at that time, especially in my home diocese of Townsville, where there's only about half a dozen diocesan priests left. So I went to the diocesan seminary, and during that time of study and reflection, um, I came to see how much I actually loved living in a religious community. And uh, I felt called to go for a retreat to a monastery to see what it was really like. So I eventually went to New Norcia, which is on the other side of Australia, about five hours flight from where I was. And I instantly fell in love with it. So uh, New Norcia is Australia's only monastic village. It's like a, a piece of Barcelona in the middle of outback Australia with these uh, magnificent old buildings, this great heritage, this wonderful library and a wonderful liturgy and so forth. So I I felt called to join there. But it wasn't an easy decision because to say goodbye to my home diocese, my hometown, the part of Australia where my family and friends lived was hard. But, uh, you know, I knew that God was calling me to do this. And mm -hmm. I felt a special affinity with, with St. Benedict as I came to learn about his life and his approach. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I became a monk about 10 or 11 years ago. And, um, and since then, I have found this, this life, this, uh, it's a balance between the cultivation of silence and solitude, the contemplation of God, the glorification of God through prayer and study, as well as the apostolic dimension of, uh, of a parish of leading retreats, or of seeing people for spiritual direction and so forth. So for me, I found that this is really what God has been calling me to. Father Robert, if you don't mind me asking, how many monks do you live in New Norcia, uh, novices or, or professors? Yeah, look, our community is very small today. We have only six monks in residence. Oh, wow. In, in our heyday, we had up to 70. This was in the late 19th century, so 70 months, right? Yeah. Uh, my goodness. Okay, well, you're enough to hold down the fort, I'm sure, all on your own. So, <laughs> Father Luke, could you go ahead and share a bit of your story? Sure. Uh, thank you, Fathers. I enjoyed listening to your story there a little bit. Um, I uh, grew up in a nominally Catholic family in Indiana and uh, went to public schools and kind of wasn't really into church for quite a while. So my mom had a big conversion on a Marian pilgrimage when I was in high school. I was uh, really into jazz and classical guitar. <laughs> so there's a connection there. And um, then I had a big conversion myself my freshman year and ended up at Franciscan University of Steubenville for my undergrad, father, just like you. <laughs> and I too discerned a lot of different communities, including the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And uh, mm -hmm. as I visited different uh, monasteries and different religious orders, um, Kind of like, I guess you'd say, like dating. You know, you got to, as I look back, I realized the Lord was clarifying for me little by little the things that I wasn't called to. As so I would visit somewhere and I would feel, you know, maybe this isn't quite the right fit. But, and then in the midst of that, the clarity came of what I was called to. And uh, sure enough, I ran into the Friars of the Renewal, my community. They just started a few years earlier there, where Renewal Community in the Bronx. And, um, I never really wanted to go to New York City. <laughs> Being in small town Indiana, big cities make me nervous, but I, I go to visit. And sure enough, I loved it. I was like, oh no, this is it, this is it. So I graduated, joined the Friars back in 96. And then, um, you know, you're in a religious order for quite a while, good seven to 10 years before you make your final vows. So over those years of living it and discerning and getting beyond just how do I feel today, but having a, a look on how things have gone over the years, and uh, felt a real deep inner conviction that much to my surprise that this is where I fit in God's plan. And yeah. uh, so 26 years later, it's still an adventure and it's still a joy. The small town boy out in the big city in his robe. <laughs> That's quite a change. It's beautiful. Father Miller, go ahead. Um, so I, I also grew up in a, in a very Catholic home. Um, my mom's family has been Catholic for generations. But my dad uh, in his family was raised an atheist. Uh, everybody in his family were atheists. Uh, but uh, when he was in high school and, subs and later on in college, uh, he began looking at religion and uh, eventually found his way more intellectually initially uh, to the Catholic Church and became a very staunch Catholic after that. So when he met my mom, they got married. Uh, we were raised very Catholic. 
Uh, obviously, I have 11 brothers and sisters. My uh, father always wanted a big family. And when he told my mother on their second date, she said, well, I'm only giving you four. So uh, <laughs> um, to this day, she's glad he won. And uh, there are 12 of us. But uh, growing up with a great devotion to Our Lady, I remember seeing my father pray the rosary every day, uh, mm -hmm. even on his own. And we would often pray as a family. Um, so I went to Franciscan as well. And while there, uh, even though, honestly, uh, Father Luke, you have to believe me, I wanted to be a CFR, the Lord called me to go to the Marians. I was not very happy about that initially. Uh, but, you know, the Lord can be insistent. So uh, I spent three years with them and then I uh, realized that was not my vocation. And I'd say I wandered around a little bit for a few years, uh, unsure exactly in what direction I needed to to go to do the Lord's will. I knew I was meant to be a priest. I wanted to be a religious, uh, but I just couldn't see clearly. Um, so I kind of defaulted uh, to the diocesan priesthood in Charlotte. It's my home par uh, diocese. Uh, and I told them when I joined, I said, look, I know I need to continue my discernment. I don't know where else I should go. So I'm calling you guys. <laughs> and they're very open, of course. Um, and during that, those years of, of formation and discernment, I began to realize that this is exactly where the Lord wanted me. Uh, so I was ordained in 2010 and been serving in various parishes and now I've been a pastor for about 10 years at St. Dorothy's. So I couldn't be happier. I just you love are, it. You are very beloved there. I know Father oh. Miller. So I think the Lord and his insistence put you in the right place. I think so. Father Robert, I've read about your community at New Norcia and that you are responsible. I think you've mentioned for coordinating the monks daily sung prayers and liturgies and that you even sometimes find time to write new liturgical compositions you look after the monastery's famous pipe organ all amazing work if you could translate that kind of work into the daily life of a lay person let's say we're probably most of the people watching us today are our lay people living out lives having to support families feed yeah. kids all that how do you translate the work we must do by necessity into making it holy and building that interior life? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. So one of the realities of monastic life today, especially for smaller monasteries, is that most of the monks are called upon to fulfill multiple roles, to multitask. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a reality also for, for, for lay people in the world. I mean, they're mothers, fathers, and often have a range of different works and responsibilities, parish activities and so forth. Um, so the key, I think, is to keep in mind that ultimately everything we do is done for the service and the glorification of God. You know, and St. Paul exhorts us in one of our letters, work always not as if we're working for a merely human master, but as if we're working for a divine master in the service of God. So I think to, to say a, a little prayer, a very brief prayer before we undertake any activity, both to remind ourselves of that and to implore God's assistance and grace. Um, and it's also, I think, a, a, a key to being able to do this is to, to set aside a certain amount of time for, for holy solitude, um, literally for, for, for doing nothing but being in the company of God. And this might be only five or ten minutes each day, but it makes such a huge difference, I think, in keeping the right balance. So not to let our tasks master us, but to remain uh, in mastery of everything that we do, making it an offering to God, knowing that God sometimes asks a lot of us, but he will never ask more than we can possibly do. It's beautiful. Father Luke, you in a community as well, what would you add to that about making your daily work holy. Oh, that is the topic, isn't it? <laughs> you know, um, sanctification of, of our day. So one of the joys of being in a religious community um, versus some other vocations where you're, you're a little more on your own. So in, in, in a community, we have communal prayer. And so we have what we, we like to describe as almost like a skeleton. So throughout the day, there's moments when the bell rings and we gather in our chapel to pray the breviary. In my community, we pray the office of readings and morning prayer and midday prayer and evening prayer and night prayer. And we have mass and holy hour and rosary, all these things together. 
and there's space throughout the day, which is a really ancient tradition. I think the early church picked up from the Jewish people. There's some indication that at the temple in Jerusalem, there was kind of a cycle of a liturgical life and prayer. And in the midst of that, there's a sanctification of the day. And then the gaps of time in between each of those, that prayer structure would be like meat on the bone where you're doing ministry or work or chores or uh, all sorts of different things. And um, in, I know I'm a Franciscan, Fathers of Benedictine, but there is the maxim aura et labora, you know, prayer and work and how the two complement and inform each other. And I think that's true for all of us as well. Mm, absolutely. Father Miller, obviously, we've said you're a diocesan priest at a very active parish, lots of families, mm -hmm. lots of moms and dads coming. What would you say in your collection of parishioners is the one thing that is keeping people truly holding them back from becoming a saint and living holier lives? Well, I think if we presume, you know, a sacramental life and a prayer life, which I, I think is fair to assume, because if you're not doing that, then nothing else we say is going to matter. Um, I always think that the one thing that we in general struggle with is perseverance, you know, especially in the midst of suffering, you know, it's those little daily crosses that, that grind us down. And more often than not, you know, in a moment of weakness, we complain, we, we refuse to carry our cross, you know, we just want to give up. So I think the common problem I see in my parishioners and of course in myself is, is perseverance in the midst of the cross or in the midst of suffering. Um, mm -hmm. the, in the New Testament, in many of the letters, it's constantly referred to as essential for growth and faith, right, and, and holiness. So yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to just encourage people to persevere. Mm -hmm. Father Robert, would you add to that things that you see keep hold people back from growing in holiness? Yeah, uh, so I, I think there are quite a number of things which can these days hold people back from holiness. And uh, one of these, I think, is uh, Father Luke mentioned before mm -hmm. the uh, aura at labora. And I think in our modern world, we see too much labora and too little aura. Uh, too much busyness, people allowing themselves to be completely consumed and occupied with whatever is, you know, is, is requiring and the, and the devil actually uses um, overwork as a way of pulling people's soul back from heavenly things you know so our, our souls actually have a natural tendency towards sanctity because that's what god created us for that, that that's our natural state but so many things um impede us in this and i think it could sometimes be uh this excessive overwork sometimes even in virtuous works where people overcommit themselves and mm -hmm. stretch themselves too thin. So um, the need for this certain amount of, of holy leisure, and this is something which St. Benedict emphasizes quite a lot in his rule, that he need, that they need to keep uh, prayer, leisure, recreation, study, uh, and work all in their healthy balance. Mm. When these things get out of balance is when is when the devil can creep in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, Father Luke, the Franciscans of the Renewal, you are known for working with some of the poorest of the poor, the destitute, the homeless, the drug addicts, women in crisis pregnancies, just a whole gamut of poverty. How does that work with impoverished groups for you, your, your fellow brothers, um, whether you're a priest or a volunteer with groups like that, you know, whether you're the person handing out canned corn with St. Vincent de Paul or the priest like yourself in the streets with people, how does that help a person truly grow in holiness? Yeah, thank you. I have to try to slim down what I want to say. I've got about 20, 20 bullet points to answer that one. <laughs> but um, I think really it comes back to the gospel and it comes back to the, the, the reality that our faith, um, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple, a devout Catholic, it isn't just a matter of uh, doing devotions or prayers or wearing scapulars or getting to Mass on Sunday, you know, but it's like an integration to your whole life, which includes some sort of work with the poor. I mean, Jesus himself has been highlighted quite a bit by a number of popes, including recently Pope Francis, that uh, somehow serving Jesus and the poor isn't just for a couple of people. It's actually essential 
to the gospel. And that comes in so many different ways. You think of the spiritual works of mercy, the corporal works of mercy. And um, I'll tell you over these years of living and working and serving the poor, our community uh, had uh, been, our founders had been good friends with Mother Teresa of Calcutta, St. Mother Teresa, and had been inspired by her and encouraged by her to, to start this renewal, which would have a more intentional focus on living and working with the poor. And as the years have gone on, there's been a really subtle yet profound shift in my own experience in prayer life. I think in the beginning, there's the idea of, of um, being in the category of the haves, and we're here to help and bless those who are the have-nots. And, uh, and sometimes with people who are drug addicted or mentally ill or in the streets, that dynamic, uh, it feels very clear and apparent. They're very needy and wounded and, and, and need a lot of aid. But what ends up happening is you start to realize that you always receive more than you give. Mm -hmm. And that particularly the relationships and the friendships that, you know, maybe they're getting a sandwich, but there's a beautiful, profound grace that comes to you through them. And so there's kind of this beautiful give and take, this giving and receiving that happens with the Lord's grace, where you're serving Jesus, you're you're trying to find his, what Mother Teresa would call, he's wearing a distressing disguise, <laughs> the poor, and you're looking for his presence so that you can express your love to him by loving his, you know, least of his brothers, but then also to allow the Lord to minister to you and speak to you through the encounter with the person who is poor. Mm. And being in a place where you realize, as it says in the catechism, we are all beggars before God. Mm. Father, what was it like just to go on, continue with that for a moment? You are from a small town. I think, did you say Indiana from the Midwest? What yeah. was it like just first couple of times that you were out in New York or New, New Jersey on dirty streets with people who are really seemed quite lost? Were you, were you scared at all when you began that kind of ministry? Yes. It was intimidating. It was like, um, for me, a metaphor would be getting out of the boat to walk on the water. Sure. Well, this is uncomfortable, you know, like, um, but it's one of these things where um, so often the Lord will invite us to get out of our comfort zone to help us to grow, help us to stretch. Um, one of our priests says it really well. It's time to get out of your comfort zone and into the zone of the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Mm. It's beautiful. Father Miller, you may not be dealing with as many drug addicts in a parish. I have my fair share. <laughs> um, but you do have something somewhat um, difficult for people, and that's children. You have many families. Mm. You have children coming and going, both for mass. You probably have sacramental prep classes. And that's that's not everyone's uh, cup of tea, is, is dealing with children <laughs> and the very young, young Catholics. So what do you think is of highest importance for parents to do in childhood, for those par parents just coming and going from daily mass with the toddlers and the babies and living in the narthex for 60 minutes, uh, what should they be doing to focus on, to strive for holiness with those children? How do you form the interior life of a child? Well, the first thing is to have an interior life yourself. I mean, if so many uh, of us, you know, parents don't, uh, draw close to the Lord as Father Robert and Father Luke have been saying, you know, through silence, through their own works of charity and prayer. So their, their own relationship with Christ might not be very deep. Um, so that's what they need to work on first. Um, but in doing so, something that's going to help more than anything with their children is just praying with their children and allowing their children to see them in prayer. Uh, I, I've seen that influence a child more than anything else the parent says or does, uh, just actually spending time with the child in conversation with God, because that's how a child learns to talk to God. Um, and many, many parents, uh, I'd say the average Catholic, um, is not necessarily comfortable with their own relationship with God, and so they're not comfortable trying to form a relationship between their children and the Lord. So it's one of the things I try to talk about a lot and, and give direction and formation. And um, so the, the general advice I give and just offer this to any of our viewers uh, would be uh, if you're if you don't have a deep or a personal relationship with the Lord yet, that's fine. That's where you begin. You know, introduce yourself to Jesus. You know, sit down one day alone with the Lord and say, Jesus, it's me. 
I know we don't talk often, but uh, I know I'm supposed to get to know you better. So you just be very frank and honest with him and, and be who you are with all of your strengths and weaknesses. And you will see the Lord, you know, meet you, come to you and encounter you where you need him. Right. So often we we are fearful or uh, because we think we have to get to Jesus. Well, he's the one who already came down to earth. He's already come to us. We just have to avail ourselves to his presence. And, and he'll do the rest. Mm. Beautiful. Father Robert, I had a question for you on, on one of the, mm. on one of my favorite books that I, we mentioned before, The Passion of the Christ Through the Eyes of Mary by St. Anselm of Canterbury um, and other authors. And so this book take you, takes you through a dialogue, as you know, between St. Anselm and the Blessed Mother, uh, recalling the, the details, truly details of her son's crucifixion and death. How valuable do you think it is for a Catholic to read something like this book, to put themselves in the place of the Blessed Mother, to see with new eyes the suffering of our Lord and his passion? How does that truly help someone really zoom down the path towards sainthood? Well, the contemplation of, of the passion of Christ, and in particular, the contemplation of it in the presence of and through the eyes of the Blessed Virgin Mary, it's something which really can set our heart aflame with this with this love of God, with this compassion. And this compassion is not only for the suffering of Christ, but also for the suffering of Christ present in our fellow man. And as Father Luke talks about the service of the poor, mm -hmm. to see in all human suffering the suffering of Christ. Mm -hmm. To see also in all human suffering the possibility of, of resurrection, of glory, of redemption. And we can do this no more powerfully than through the perspective of Mary. And for myself, uh, in my spiritual life, the the great hymn, the Starbet Mater Dolorosa, mm -hmm. has always been one which touched my heart so deeply. And um, I've always felt this special um, closeness to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Even at those stages in my life when my when my faith might have been, you know, wavering a little bit or whatever, um, there's nothing which would take me away from my love and devotion to her. And through this love and devotion to her, to come and look at her son, uh, our Lord Jesus, through those same eyes of love. And we have to allow our hearts to be broken for this love of God to be poured out. This is only the, the way we can become complete, is, is by allowing our hearts to be broken, um, and, and this love of God both to flow in to us and also to be able to flow out to others. So this uh, is this work by St. Anselm, um, his dialogue with the Blessed Virgin on the Passion of Christ, it really is a very touching and heart-rending work. And my own experience of translating it was, you know, I'd have to have to have to stop and and and, and pray or think about these things deeply before going on any further. Mm. So, um, yeah, so, so in union with, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and of course she is a maternal figure. You know, I've never met a single person, um, whether they're Catholic, whether they're not, whether they're atheist, who, who doesn't have this, this, this love, this sense of the, uh, the wonderful beauty and grace of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So she gives us the eyes and the heart with which to love Jesus. And that, in turn, gives us the eyes and the heart of compassion with which to look upon the sufferings of our fellow brothers and sisters. Mm. And, Father, just to stay on the books for a moment, I mean, I, I've held them up a bit before, but they're just your work is so beautiful in them. The set is beautiful itself. If you were to tell our viewers today, maybe from any of the Tiana Resurrection titles, which do you feel is most accessible today's to today's modern reader that perhaps doesn't have any sort of advanced religious degree or a strong interior life, but would like to launch in to one of these right now to start building on that holy prayer life? One which I would particularly recommend for people who are either not that immersed in the faith or, you know, um, maybe their interest is not as strong as, as what it could be, is The Glories of Heaven by St. Anselm of Canterbury. This is quite a short book. Now, St. Anselm is known primarily as a great theologian and philosopher, 
but he was also a wonderful mm. devotional writer. And in this book, he does something which is, I guess, pretty unusual. He describes in detail what it's going to be like in heaven. And mm. this is, is something which you don't often find at all in our Catholic literature. Of course, getting to heaven is uh, in union with God is the ultimate goal of our journey. But, um, you know, we often don't think about it. We often don't think in much detail about what it's going to be like. We just say it's all infinitely beyond us and leave it at that. But this book so beautifully describes it. Very wonderful. It's a wonderful exhortation uh, to the practice of the faith by inflaming the desire for this celestial homeland. And this is something which St. Benedict, um, our own Holy Father, talks about in his rule, that we should always be filled with heavenly longing. And this book cert will certainly awaken that flame of heavenly longing within the hearts of anyone who reads it. Mm. Well, and certainly there are so many wonderful spiritual uh, writers to choose from, church fathers, up into modern day writers. Uh, Father Luke, you deal with people uh, who run the gamut, ages and where they are in life. Do you have a certain writer that you recommend to, let's say, someone in their 20s versus to someone in their 50s or 60s? Do you have people that you recommend for someone to advance their spiritual life based on the different generation or age they're falling in? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh I, you know, as Father Nixon was talking, I was thinking, um, what a debt of gratitude we owe to Tan Books. And Father, for your translations, it's like you have kind of rediscovering and making accessible to English language audiences some just classics. And, and it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, to answer your question, Mary, uh, you know, it depends on the topic. In different topics, there's, there's I think all of us priests, uh, we have like my here's the go-to book for this topic or that topic or you know and it seems like in many of the topics that people are struggling with there seems to be just such a plethora of really wonderful materials out there um that are kind of people seem to have become a specialist in this topic or that topic or this area or that area that uh whether it be questions regarding all sorts of different human conundrums <laughs> You know, there's there's so many different authors that you could point people towards. Um, one one of which, which I'll mention, is Saint Therese Little Flower, a doctor of the church, um, and she seems to be so accessible. And um, she comes across as somewhat simple, but there's actually an amazing depth and profundity to her teaching, and it seems to be accessible and, and helpful to so many people from so, so many different backgrounds. Mm. Hmm. We're going to go ahead and take a question from our viewing audience right now. So exciting. Um, we'd like to each uh, have you answer Teresa, who's asking, do you have any suggestions for overcoming feelings of unworthiness of someone trying to start down a spiritual path, but feeling unworthy in doing so due to perhaps childhood trauma? And how do you forgive yourself if from sins in your past that you've already confessed you've you've moved beyond the confessional but you still have trouble letting those go and feeling like you're unworthy to even begin this monumental task of building your interior life father miller would you begin yes so th this is a very common problem that i, I would say i deal with uh, on a weekly basis with uh, parishioners or, or, or catholics just visiting saint dorothy's and needing some advice and direction um, the first things first in regards to forgiving oneself for past sins, uh, I always remind uh, the person, you know, or I ask the person, have you gone to confession? You know, if they've gone to confession, then I, I tell them, did, did the Lord forgive you? And they always say, oh, yes, you know, Father gave me absolution. The Lord forgave me. And I said, so it's quite arrogant of you to assume that God, who is perfect and just in all things, has deemed it, you know, able to forgive you and somehow you're for refusing to forgive yourself you know so do you think you're a better judge than god <laughs> you know do you think you're better at judging your own soul than the lord is he's already forgiven you what are you worried about so if that kind of a temptation is actually rooted in our pride that we don't trust the lord's judgment even when he's merciful right we think we can judge ourselves better than he can and so it's it's something that the individual has to repent of and, you know, and then learn to focus more upon his mercy 
his forgiveness as opposed to you know, their own thoughts or feelings or judgments, which are secondary. In regards to the healing of past traumas and wounds, um, so one of my backgrounds is psychology and I, I've done a lot of work in this area. Um, and what I've discovered is the reason these memories still plague us uh, is because more often than not, we prevent our Lord and our lady from entering into those memories. Usually with past trauma, there's a lot of shame uh, associated with it and guilt. And when there's shame and guilt, we can imagine like a little child. When you catch them doing something bad, they'll cover their face and say, don't look at me. <laughs> right? It's their shame that wants them to hide. Well, even as adults, that shame can lead us to hide from Christ, to hide from the Blessed Mother. And the only way for our Lord to heal those memories is if we allow him in. So I usually lead people uh, through a three stage, uh, three stages of meditation to help them to allow the Lord in. And I'll just go over it real quick so all of our viewers can hear it. So the first thing is you have to be able to remember what happened to you. If you're not there yet, you need some counseling until you're able to at least remember what happened. Once you do that, I always recommend this in, in the presence of the priest or your counselor or in front of the Blessed Sacrament, that's ideal. Uh, you have to allow Jesus to visibly be present in your memory as you're reliving it. Even though it's painful and difficult, he doesn't say anything and he doesn't do anything, but he just stands there in a corner. He's outside the window looking in when he, and he sees what happens, what you did, what happened to you, doesn't matter what it is. Once you find some semblance of peace with our Lord's presence, because he was there, he's everywhere. Um, then you allow him to speak. If Jesus was there, what would he have said to you or to the person that hurt you, right? What would he have said? What truth would he have spoken? You already know this for the most part, and you just have to allow him to say it in the memory. And it can take days and sometimes weeks of quiet meditation until you can get comfortable with our Lord's presence and when then with our Lord speaking. Once our Lord can speak and you're comfortable with that in reliving the memory, then what you do is you actually allow him to act, allow him to change your memory. I had a, a, a beautiful soul who had a very traumatic experience where someone threatened her life when she was a little girl. And in the final stages of the healing, Jesus ran up, grabbed her out of the hands of the person who was going to threaten her and said, don't touch my daughter. And he carried her off to safety. And she said, once she saw that in her memory, all of the pain went away and it had no hold over her anymore. And it's just it's beautiful. I've seen that many times with, with my parishioners and with others. Wow. Wow, exceptionally powerful. My goodness, thank you for sharing that, Father. Father Robert, would you like to add to that on feelings of unworthiness and- Yeah. Look, um, what, what Father Miller had, has spoken about, about the efficacy of sacramental confession, that people often, you know, um, feel unworthy they feel impaired by sins which have actually been sacramentally forgiven by god through the ministry of the church and that really frees a person from sin and feelings of of unworthiness and so forth in a sense every human being is infinitely unworthy of the graces of god even the very greatest saint but in another sense every human being is made with the image and likeness of god and has this uh, dignity of being a, a divine son or daughter. What I would say is feelings of unworthiness uh, come from looking too closely at yourself. If you can imagine, if you look at yourself very, very closely in a mirror, you're going to see all kinds of, you know, imperfections, faults, and so forth. The answer is don't look too closely at yourself. Look, look instead at the glories of heaven. Look instead at, um, you know, one book I would recommend is The Crown of the Virgin. And this book is um, is a meditation upon the splendor, the beauty, the glory uh, of the Queen of Heaven. This is what we should be looking at, not ourselves. If we look at ourselves, if we look at our own lives, often we'll find, you know, um, a, a, a disaster or at least a bit of a disaster. We look instead at the Kingdom of Heaven. We look at Jesus. We look at Mary. And we find it's all beauty, peace, tranquility, power, and so forth. This is what we're aspiring. Like a person driving a car looks at what's coming ahead. They're not looking at what they've passed by. 
and all of that stuff sins traumas of the past you know let go it's only our looking at them our, our thinking about them our fixation on them which makes us hang on to them mm. so allow ourselves to forgive allow ourselves to be uh, forgiven and just to let go mm. beautiful father luke you must see this so frequently that was speaking of people who have trauma or deal with people yeah. in traumatic situations so your thoughts on this oh yeah well a couple of things first of all just to note that uh, in some cases when we use like a term like childhood trauma or whatever there is no shame in getting professional psychological help and it is amazing how um, in the science of psychology so many things have been learned about uh, the brain and the way it processes memories and, and a lot of people focusing in on trauma in particular and even scrupulosity sometimes could be more psychological than anything else. And there's no shame, particularly if you can find somebody who's really solidly Catholic and Christian, uh, blending the, you know, staying authentic to the faith, but also insights from modern psychology. There's no shame in that at all. And then uh, two, two spiritual things I would advise, one of which would be the devotion and writings of the Divine Mercy from St. Faustina. We have a funny joke in our friaries. If you see a brother bringing her diary to the holy hour, you'd be like, oh, bro, you having a bad day? You know, but it's just that promise of mercy and grace that Jesus gives through that devotion has been so healing and encouraging to people who struggle. And then the other thing is praying with um, gospel passages where Jesus encounters sinners. And uh, whether it be the woman at the well, whether it be um, the famous parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, or there's so many of these stories where Jesus has encounters with people who were sinful and then the way he treats them with such great love and mercy to do like um, uh, Lexio Divina or healing prayer with some of these stories from the gospels. Um, I have a hunch that that might be part of the reason why the early church wanted to write them down and preserve them because in praying with those stories, we can receive a lot of grace. Mm. Amen. Wonderful answers. Very good. Thank you for that question, Teresa. Another question coming in from Meredith from our chat. This is appropriate since we just celebrated All Saints Day. How can we incorporate the saints, especially our patron saints, uh, to build and strengthen our interior lives? Great question, Meredith. Father Miller, would you like to start? Oh, sure. So um, it, I think we have to start treating the saints more like real people. <laughs> I know they are real people, but uh, real people who are actually in our lives, they're just invisible. Um, it's the same way we need to think of our guardian angels, right? Th this person who's been with us our whole life since conception, and yet they're just invisible. We need to start acting like they're really there, you know, talking like they're really there and celebrating their feast days. So at home, you know, when it's my birthday, it's a special day and the family celebrates it. So, you know, if, if I am supposed to have a, a special patroness or patron uh, saint, then I need to act like their day is important. You know, get them a card, even if you just put it on your table, you know, you know get a cake that day. I, you know, there's any number of things that you can do to celebrate them just on a practical level as a Catholic or as in your family. And that is going to lead more than anything to a deeper relationship with, with them. Um, just the practical interactions that you would normally have with any other person in your life, just make the saints part of that. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, Father Robert, same question to you, but also, um, did you feel like you grew closer to the saints in translating these books and coming into such close contact with their writing and translating their little literal words for other people to be able to read. Yes, Mary, very much so. And, uh, you know, the saints are such an important part of the Catholic spirituality. Um, what I what I like to do each day is look at the Actus Sanctorum for each day. And this, this was a tremendous compilation put together over a period of 300 or 400 years by the Jesuits. And every day there are listed between 20 and 50 saints, as well as details of their lives and writings. And to read at least one of these lives, and it, every day I discover a new saint and read a fascinating new story. I think it's a great idea for Catholics to get a book which has, uh, and I know Ted puts out some of these, um, which has like daily lives of saints. 
to, to immerse ourselves in the lives of these saints because they're, they're often so exciting. They read like novels, you know. And the lives of the saints during the Middle Ages were really the equivalent of novels because there were no, like, you know, detective stories or whatever. But people read the lives of these saints for, for inspiration and for edification. We shouldn't confine our reading just to Scripture because, you know, most Catholics after a few years find they basically know all the stories and how they end and so forth. But the lives of the saints offer us such wonderful things. And and to to make like notes of the saints who appeal to us, who can be our particular patrons, either because we've got something in common with them or they're in the same kind of situation or they have some virtue or property which we admire so much. So, yes, to, to admire all these saints and to find out about them, which is a fairly easy thing to do these days, luckily. Mm -hmm. mm, absolutely. Father Luke? I was going to say dress like them, but <laughs> it's religious. We do that already. <laughs> Halloween is the one night friars don't like to go out because <laughs> people are like, what a great costume. And you're like, this is not a costume. Oh, but you know, there's one thing to look like a person like on the outside, but to look like them on the inside, mm. you know, like reading about them, praying to them, um, maybe having a holy card or a picture, and then also be pinpointing what were the things for which they got canonized, things they were known for, and then to imitate them. You know, uh, I know there's all sorts of different beautiful customs and traditions connected to different saints in the way that they model following Jesus. I think of the words of St. Paul, imitate me as I follow Christ. You know, we need examples. We need people who remind us that the living of this faith is possible no matter who you are, no matter what your state in life, no matter what difficulties or imperfections you might be facing. There are saints who who there that they're, they're there to encourage us and to show us that it is possible. Mm. Really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just conclude by stating I have to apologize. Uh, we have adoration here at the shrine, and as we've been talking, I got a message that the adorer uh, is sick and can't come in. I have to duck out to go uh, cover adoration. Uh, so we have divine mercy at three, and then adoration going throughout. So as I'm leaving now, and I apologize. I will be praying and interceding uh, for all of you who are watching and for you, Mary and Father Nixon and Father Miller. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Father Luke. I mean, I go. <laughs> that's a doozy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so. uh, thank you, Father, for being part of this. And thank you for taking our pro prayers, petitions and needs to the Lord yes. in the Blessed Sacrament. Thank you. Within five minutes, I'll be praying for all of you with the presence of our Lord. God bless you. What a blessing. Thank God you, Father. You. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Thanks, Father. Well, we'll take that as our own cue to wrap up, I suppose. I feel like we should probably go to adoration, too, the three of us. I mean, can't let Father Luke <laughs> top us in holiness. I do have confessions in a little bit. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So, Father Robert, are you going to lunch or something, or do you have something holy to go to? <laughs> yeah, I've got a little bit more work to get through here at TED headquarters uh, today. So. Ah, very good. Okay, well, duty calls. So... Thank you for everyone joining us today for this TAN Roundtable. Again, all of the beautiful books we discussed today, these are available at tanbooks.com at the TAN Resurrection tab. We have a winner, Gerardo Rodriguez. Congratulations to you, Gerardo. You are the winner of a set of these beautiful TAN Resurrection books. If you are not Gerardo, don't worry. You have a 40% off code, TANTALK40, at our website. Add any of these wonderful titles to the, your cart check out with Tan Talk 40, you'll get 40% off. They would make amazing gifts as well for the coming Christmas season. Any questions, please email us at talks at tanbooks.com. We will see you not next month, but actually next week, one week from today, we have a rescheduled round table with Father Chad Ripperger and other guests for the errors of Protestantism. Woo, that is going to be a great one. Um, that is next Thursday, November 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Make sure to join us for that incredible discussion. Um, Father Miller, before we go, would you please give us your blessing? Oh. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you. May he turn his face toward you and give you peace. He who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Robert, for joining us, for making this trip stateside so you could participate in this with us. Loved hearing from you today, from Father Miller, from you as well. 
Um, God bless to all of our viewers. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Father Miller. Father.